Have you ever had a brilliant idea, but with no resources or data you could use to act upon it? Or what does it feel like to make the switch from one passion project to another that could potentially last a lifetime? With a laundry list of grand challenges, we are all called upon each and every day to think of -of out-of-the-box ways to make our world a more sustainable place. This show is about inspiring individuals and their journey along the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. I'm your host, Peter Marcus Bach, and this is the Grand Challenges Podcast. My guest today is Juan Pablo Rodriguez Sanchez, an associate professor at Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. Juan Pablo addresses pressing issues around sustainable management of drainage systems and the implementation of nature-based solutions in his home city, reaching upon novel and interesting information sources in light of resource and data constraints. In today's show, we discuss how Juan Pablo has made Bogota his research playground and how he is following his heart in encouraging the widespread adoption of nature-based solutions to adapt the city to future challenges. For more information, refer to the show notes over at peterambach.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining and please enjoy the show. Juan Pablo, welcome to the show. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much for inviting me. Good to have you here and um, good to see you again. The last time we saw each other, I think, was in Lyon back in 2019. I think so, before pandemics. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's good to to be conferencing again together and just to exchange lots of ideas and yeah. to be able to do the show. Yes, yes. What I like the most of the conferences to meet again friends and, uh, well, to enjoy cities and traveling and so on. Definitely. And yeah, I'm looking forward to traveling more, but I guess there's one place that I really do want to go to at some point. It's on my to travel list, which is Colombia, where you're from. You are most welcome anytime. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I've been to South America before, but never to Colombia. Where where in South America? To Peru, Brazil, and Argentina. Okay. Yeah, I did a trip once, Uh again, because of a conference. I see. Yeah, I think you, you were in Brazil in 2011. Yes, that okay, was a, I was there. We urban drainage nerds were uh-huh. all together there in Brazil in 2011. That's a while ago. Yeah, yeah. It feels like ages ago. No, definitely. <laughs> but it's not that much actually. Yeah, when you think about it. Yeah. But I had the chance to actually go to the Colombian Pavilion at the Dubai Expo, and uh-huh. I tell you what I saw was really impressive. I mean, apart from the coffee and the arepas that I had, which I really enjoy, I must say. So I'm uh-huh. looking forward to the original. But the country really struck me as this really beautiful, really vibrant, natural or nature-filled country. And I think that's also reflected in the culture as well. So I find it very exciting. And to also get a bit of a, an insight into your life there, the kind of research you do there, particularly in the field of green infrastructure. And yeah, to just have fun today. Well, great. Yes, I'm, I'm happy that you already know something about my country. As you said, it's a very rich in a different way, it's a very rich in terms of nature, water, vegetation, animals, and so on. And also very rich in terms of cultural aspects, songs, music, literature, and so on. Definitely. And dance. A lot of, yes. I'm not very good in that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, but, I try to move my feet, but I don't think you would call it dance. <laughs> Perhaps you are much better than me. <laughs> no, no, who knows. I play the piano, but I think I will stay seated with the instrument rather than moving around. <laughs> I see. <laughs> but I think one very interesting aspect, or one very interesting topic that we covered just walking back from uh, the conference dinner yesterday you mentioned something about a horse and a cow yeah tell uh, me about that it was my childhood when my father and my mother get married my grandfather gives to my father a lot in the uh, let's say peri-urban area of a small town and my father is an architect so he was planning to do by himself our house and there is nothing about that area So my grandfather also gave us as a gift to my brother and myself, a cow and a horse. The horse name was Rocinante. Okay. That is is a character in El Quixote. Ah, okay. So yeah, I have good memories of that. Having a cow just besides my house and going to feed the cow, feed the horse. So nice memories. Yeah. And so you grew up more in the rural countryside of Colombia? Yeah. I grew up in a small town near the capital, which is called Chia. That means moon in the native language. So yes, my grandparents live in the rural area, close to my place. So close to a mountain. So yes, a lot of nature around, not much urbanized areas nearby. And that was near the capital city of Bogota? Yeah. Yeah. It's very close to Bogota. But to me, by that time, Bogota was looking just as a very complex and big city. Too much for me. I mean, I prefer like a rather more calm environment. So that was perfect for my childhood. Nice, nice. And so are the horse and the cow still there? No, not anymore. Actually, recently I went again to visit where I used to live and I didn't recognize the area. 
it changes dramatically. A lot of new buildings, new houses, roads and everything. So no more place for cows and, oh, wow. and horses over there. So some rapid urbanization that's happened in the last, well, few decades. Yeah, it is happening not only in that town, but actually in many other towns surrounding Bogota. And actually in Bogota, it happened the same. But this rapid urbanization process yeah. changing, well, not only the land use that we want to understand better to better inform the planning work, but also it changed like human relationships. It changed the connection and the links with a place. So it yeah. was a very different feeling going back. I, I didn't feel at home anymore okay. when I went recently. No, that's a pity. But I hear that, yeah, there's been a lot of changes in Colombia. In fact, I think recently I was reading that it became one of these destinations for digital nomads now. I'm noticing people are going to Cartagena and Bogota to sort of set up shop. And I think it's more for the web developers or people that work on media. Yes, I have heard the news about that. And I, what people like the most is that you can find very beautiful landscapes near, let's say, medium to big size cities that are very well occupied but you very fast get to an amazing landscape where very like relaxing and inspiring sets and nature sets so yeah i would love to do that no, <laughs> in, definitely. in my country to travel around and uh, not only working in an office and you know to change a bit the actual day-to-day -day life no definitely and i look forward to visiting it i think when you see colombia you also think of topics like biodiversity green infrastructure there's a lot of opportunity for that but also we're dealing with something where you know we're in the global south and i think there's ways to innovate in these spaces yeah I think the Colombian context is, as I said before, we have a very much rich country in terms of biodiversity, nature. So we are used to that. But in our cities, we almost forget it. I mean, mm. we really forget that we are in a in the hot spot of biodiversity, in a hot spot of nature, in a hot spot of water. So we really need to change the way the ways we are developing our cities to again become a nature rich water rich i think it's part of our fingerprint i mean it's in our soul somehow and in a way that is really now where a lot of your research has taken you in this green infrastructure ecosystem services space to protect a lot of those values and the beauty of the country that you've described yeah and so a lot of these experiences and really the passion you have for your country has shaped where you're in now which is that green infrastructure space but you weren't always in there actually you know we say we had an urban drainage conference because that's actually where you started mm -hmm. so you did a bachelor in civil and environmental engineering at yes. Universidad de los Andes in Bogota and after that you then went to the UK to yeah. then continue your work in doing a PhD at Imperial College London and you were actually together with someone we've had on the show before Dr. Shrao Le Tao uh, which is episode one he actually kicked off this whole journey <laughs> But uh, you actually shared an office together, right? Yeah, we were sharing office together. And it was, I mean, I, I'm going to tell you a history about Joao and myself. Oh, uh, do tell. <laughs> Joao was in my office and I was starting the PhD and he was kind of in the middle. So he already had some results to present in big conference. So he was registered for a congress in Edinburgh, the International Congress on Urban Drainage, which is a key conference for us working in this field. Definitely. And Joao went to Dominican Republic and then he came back to London and was sick. I mean, no. I think because of food poisoning or something like that. And he called me and said, Juan, I cannot go anymore to the congress. Do you want to go? Everything is paid. Okay, you say, okay, yes, why not? Hey, free trip, I, why not? I, yeah, free traveling, free learning. So I said, yes. So I attend my first international congress almost for free, funded by the Portuguese government. <laughs> very I nice. hope they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful because of that opportunity was very important for me. It was my first time attending an international congress, listening to the well, researchers that I was reading a lot, but meeting person and people made the experience very different. And I was relaxed because I wasn't presenting anything. Just I was sit down to be inspired, to learn, to connect with other people having the same interests. So I really have a gratefulness for Joao and Portuguese government to <laughs> support me to go to that conference unintentionally. But it was a, a very important thing for me. No, oh, nice. And I guess you always remember that many years on. So yeah. in fact, I think you just went out with Joao to get some souvenirs for your children as well. So yeah, you definitely do hang out quite a lot still. And it's nice to see that connection last even since the PhD days. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while being friends, not only colleagues, but friends. Yeah. So that's the beauty of academia. Definitely. We make not only technical or 
intellectual connections, but personal ones. Yeah, but you started not in the green infrastructure space, but actually in sewer systems during your PhD. Yes, I did. I mean, my background, as you said, is civil and environmental engineering. So somehow I came out working in sanitation. And uh, well, in my PhD, I was trying to look at how to improve the asset management of sewer systems. And actually in developed cities or cities developing now, we're seeing a rapid expansion of the sewer system and actually managing such a system requires dealing with several thousands of kilometers of sewer lines. And this is spread over a much larger area of city itself. Yeah, yeah you're right. A cities expanded quite fast and we didn't have much time as a city to do it in a, let's say, a planned way. So sewers were everywhere without much planning and actually with not much data about its status and the operational status. So what I was interested at that time is how to operate and manage and handle with such a complex system. Because of course, well, we need sewers, but we need to understand how they are. But if we don't have data, so it was a rather challenging a scenario. So we came up using customer complaints database. But mm. that time, I think, was the most comprehensive customer complaints database used from a research perspective. Actually, if I give some context, you did a seven and a half year study across a large area where you were looking at sewer blockages. Yes. Because I guess quoting from your own paper that you published on this, you were saying like in England and Wales, at least 75% of sewer incidents are because they get blocked. Yeah. So, you know, they're not just carrying water, they're carrying waste as well. And sometimes this just builds up and starts clogging and so i guess typically other than customer complaints how do managers actually figure out where these blockages are well they can use cctv they can use like lasers they can use sonars acoustic measurements and instruments but they're kind of ineffective in a way Mm. that if you want to understand how the system is performing you need a lot of human and economic resources yeah so in big cities such as Bogota, we don't have the chance to use that. So we have to rely in alternative information or additional sources. So that's why we used this customer complaints database. So a customer just calls up and says, hey, I see a problem or my toilet doesn't flush or I don't know, there's waste on the road. Yeah, there is a flooding outside my door or something like that. And then people from the water utility goes and then check what's happening. They confirm either or not there is a problem and they classify the problem. So they say mm. this is uh, because of a blockage or it is because of a structural problem in the pipe or there is nothing it was just a false alarm okay but i guess it's a way of really narrowing down these thousands of kilometers of pipe to a, a certain area at least where rather than searching the entire city you're just searching a neighborhood block for example yeah you're right and actually this is kind of a citizen science so, somehow i mean by that time i didn't realize that it's actually citizen science that's true providing actually. data for taking decisions in a very large and complex system. So very valuable data still. A less conventional data source that you would think to use because often utilities will have lots of measurement systems and sensors in place to detect these problems. But this, in a way, is a very innovative way of then using the population, I guess, building a sense of involvement as well in the asset management and just making the problem solving or the problem finding a lot more efficient. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And so Bogota has been your, in a way, your case study city, your heart, the, the home that you do a lot of your research testing on. And so I guess you mentioned data scarcity already, but how do you deal or how do you navigate data scarcity in these kinds of case studies? Well, I think we are used to that somehow. I mean, I was talking about my childhood and I was Mm. trained in a school in which the main aim of the director or rector of a school was to try to get the most out of the an unlimited context. Mm. I mean, my school wasn't that high tech, no computers, even though at that time there were some computers, but we didn't have any computer in my school. We didn't have any like modern or very fancy buildings, very rustic, but still good to learn, good to just focus on the basic things, which sometimes are the most important ones. So from my school time, my mindset somehow was like that trying to do the most out of very limited resources. So somehow, many years after, I was trying to do actually that. And there is many different and alternative data sources that we don't realize unless you don't have data. When you don't have data, you start being more creative, more with open eyes, looking everywhere, trying to get data. So that's what that happened in Bogota. I was working with a former colleague And we were discussing, well, we can use that data. We can get trends out of the customer calls. We can identify in a certain area something is 
happening more frequently or not. And we can relate that to changes in land use, the urbanization process, and so on. So yes, that was a very interesting journey. But that time, I think it was very innovative somehow, even though coming from a developing context. Now, I, I've dealt with the data scarcity question in a more developed context, but I can sort of relate in a way. I've always had to, in my research, in a way, be resource efficient. I've had limited resources, but I've had to seek creative ways. And I think this has been somehow tested. We'll have to look for a study and put it in the show notes as an example. But I think they've done some tests where they've given people certain objects just to observe what they do. And I think people come up with the most creative ways of passing the time with just these mundane objects. Ah, interesting. Yeah, very interesting approach. But I guess really that mindset that you had from your childhood that you've managed to feed into your research. Yeah. And in a way, this seven and a half year study across this, and it was an area covering seven and a half million people actually funny coincidence that you had the same number. <laughs> yeah. But that really shed light on how you can use these alternative data sources to then solve complex operation and maintenance questions. Yeah, there is a funny thing about that model. Well, we provide the model to the water utility and actually they were using it for a while. They ran the model and they said, your model performs very well. And I asked, why? Because the model point us many different places and we go there and definitely there is a blockage. So well done. But I'm not sure if it's because of the model or because of the system. Oh. It's not in a very well condition. But anyhow, I think the model was useful somehow. And for me, it was the first time seeing that my research can actually be useful and used by my city. And as you said, Bogota has been my main case study. So I really try to better know my city and to provide tools to improve my surroundings. I find it fascinates me when I'm able to work in a city that I've been to, that I can relate to, and to just see how it sort of runs in the modeling that I do as well. So I can certainly relate. And I guess keeping that along with you across many different dimensions of research you've worked on, you know, it's like double the happiness in a way. Yeah, you're right. But you mentioned the modeling and in relation to the operation and maintenance. What I found was very interesting was something you did in a further study on wastewater systems in megacities. Mm -hmm. uh, would you class Bogota as a megacity? I think so. Yeah. It's not bigger than 10 million inhabitants, but yeah. still facing the same challenges. Yeah. I mean, there is not much difference having 7 or having 10 million. So it's just a matter of a number. But reaching, let's say, 7 or 6 or, I mean, the complexity is so much. So it's a large city. Yeah. But in these very dense and highly populated cities, you obviously have an operation and asset management nightmare. But what I really liked about one aspect of this particular study was the comment that you made that modelers should be actively involved with the monitoring for better comprehensive understanding. And I find that great because oftentimes a modeler will set up a model and then pass it on or it sort of just sits there and does its thing. But in a way, you're advocating for really going out and seeing what you are modeling so that you understand the numbers that are coming out of your model, essentially. And this is particularly crucial in, I guess, data scarce settings, in cases where you really need to make these quick decisions around asset management because every second or every failure to act can be a big cost that's incurred on the operators. Yeah, you're right. When I was at university, I had a professor. His name is Luis Camacho, still my colleague and my close friend there. And he's doing river water quality modeling. Mm -hmm. And when he was teaching water quality modeling, he always told us, you have to go to the river. You have to go to your catchment. If you want to use models before that, you have to go and really understand your system. And well, I was lucky enough before doing my PhD, I was involved in a research project in which I had to carry the measurements by myself, of course, with technicians, with support and so on. But I was the one getting into the manhole, getting into the sewer and really understanding what's happening because I don't know many people that has been into a sewer before. Well, uh, this reminds me of a previous episode we had on this podcast with Professor Anna Delitic, who also went into manholes to get data. So we should start a tally here. Yeah. This was episode eight. Yeah, I, I think I have seen her cover page. We're still trying to find it, her <laughs> cover page, yes. And I don't know, I'm trying to still go through different sources. She doesn't seem to have it, but anyways, for listeners, uh, <laughs> hopefully by now it should be in the show notes, but we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> I saw it in a previous conference, but I remember. If you have it, true. do send it to me. <laughs> uh, I have it, I remember I saw it, but. <laughs> Everyone does, but it's mysteriously disappeared. Anyways, we digress. But yeah, so really carrying your data, going and getting it yourself. Yeah, so actually, well, I was carrying my data sets before going to my PhD. I was lucky enough, I was carrying like these big, not USB memories, but 
external memories with me from Colombia to London with oh, wow. my data. So in my time in the UK was just playing with data, playing with models, but I was the one being active in getting the data. So that helped me a lot. And I used very simple, but at the same time, useful models to understand what's happening into the wastewater treatment plant. My thinking there was... For a while, people working in wastewater treatment says that we can see the sewer system as a part of the treatment facilities. True. Somehow can be true. But I was wondering how much of those treatment or those changes in the water quality comes out of the biological, physical, and so processes. But there is a lot of dynamics and stochasticity out of the way we produce wastewater in large cities. Indeed. And the system is being seen a lot more as an integrated system now. We've had integrated urban drainage, as we call it, for quite a few decades now. And there's really an interaction between the catchment itself, the sewer system and the treatment plant and receiving waters. And if you can look at the whole thing as a whole, then oftentimes your management solutions or your optimization of the system is much better. But it is complex. It is. It is. And what I found out is that it's equally important the processes that are happening, but also the stochasticity about the production of wastewater in big cities. So let's say wastewater treatment technicians and operators should, at least in large-scale treatment plants, should consider both in equal importance. And I guess moving forward since then, how do you think the situation has evolved? Has it changed? Are we doing better? We've had the emergence of many new sensing technologies for these systems, new kinds of data sets emerge. What's your opinion there? Well, I see a lot of opportunities. I mean, we have different ways to gather data in a more, let's say, cheap way, in a more somehow simple sometimes or rather complex in other cases. But at the end of the day is having more data about very complex systems and very complex processes. So as much as we know from a system or a process, the better we can support the development of tools to make decisions. So I'm always open to assess and look and use new and alternative data sources because you never know which one is the one that provides you the better understanding. Coming back to your childhood learnings. Yeah, very fascinating to see where things go. So you finished your PhD in 2012 yes. at Imperial College and then you moved back to Bogota and now you're an associate professor back at Universidad de los Andes in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. But you've also shifted your focus from, in a way, well, you're still in urban drainage, but you shifted it from the sewer systems more into now what we call the green infrastructure. Well, like I ask every guest, it seems to be a trend. I think we're going through different uh, trend lists today on this show. <laughs> what is your preferred term for this kind of technology or this kind of practice? To be honest, nature-based solutions. And I tell you why. Because that terminology, in my experience, has helped me a lot to interact with many other disciplines, such as architects, uh, biologists, ecologists, and so on. So I think it's more easier to explain to people or to talk to people. And I really discovered, for example, in my hometown, in my home country, that people were working in nature-based solutions since many years ago. And I didn't notice because I was looking also always to people that work in sustainable urban drainage systems, best management practices. So nature-based solutions is an integrative term in my experience. A very nice overarching term, I feel. In my opinion, I use both blue green infrastructures and nature based solutions. I tend to use blue green infrastructures more when we're in the city and when it's more technological, and then nature based solutions when we're looking at that planning level. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you mentioned, I do agree we are able to then relate across disciplines because it is very interdisciplinary. And historically, it's sort of emerged from many different strands, one being the, you know, the greenways movement and the planning side, and on the other, it's really the urban drainage, urban water side. And since then, I think many others have jumped on board too. So, no, very interesting. So that's your preferred term. And that's where you've now put yourself or that's where you've now centered your research around. But in a way, what motivated you to switch from sewer systems and this integrated assessment really strongly into the nature-based solution space? Well, I think it came from my time in the UK. When I was doing my PhD, I was working in conventional sewer systems. But then, by that time, the UK was let's say, promoting or has been doing somehow hard work to implement sustainable urban drainage systems in their cities. And attending different congresses and conferences, I somehow realized that this was not only the UK, but many European countries, 
are also Australia, such as your case and your work yep. there with your group and many other places. So when I went back to Colombia, I was in charge of a course, which is urban hydrology course. Okay. So I was telling my student about that time, I hope that one day in Bogota or in Colombia, we have at least some pilots of that, at least design guidelines and planning tools and so on. But I was expecting to have that in a medium, but or rather large term. But we were very lucky. I was in my university working with two colleagues. Mm -hmm. One of them already mentioned him, Luis Camacho, but also with a colleague, which is Mario Diaz Granados. And he was approached by the water utility. And the water utility has been approached by the environmental secretary of the city. They were trying to understand how this type of new or unconventional ways to handle storm water fits into our city. So Mario and Luis invited me to join that project. And that really changes everything for me. Wow. That gave me the opportunity to really work in this topic, having some funding, having the opportunity to work together with the water utility, with the environmental secretary. And we got at that time some of the best students I have ever had in my academic life. So with that rather limited budget and uh, human resources, we were not a very big research group, but all really interested in learning about SATs. But with the support of the institutions of the city, we were able to better understand how these new systems, at least for us, fit or can fit in our context. So we came up with, by that time, a rather simple planning tool, but still very useful, I think. We came up with design guidelines. Oh, we nice. came up with a pilot with a still monitoring. So I think that was, let's say, a pioneer study, at least in the academic context, that was actually being used by the municipality and the city. Nowadays, Bogota is the only city in Colombia that has these design guidelines because oh. of that project. And I think in the past, Brazil was kind of our reference in the region. But now I think that Bogota and Colombia is becoming also uh, providing insights and providing new knowledge and how in our context we can make the better use of SATs or BMPs or nature-based solutions to handle not only with stormwater, but with other environmental and social issues we are facing. I'd like you to paint a picture for me. So my experience has been primarily in Australia, the US and Europe, working with nature-based solutions. And those are fairly different climatic conditions but also different examples of why we would use these systems, what we would use them for. In Australia, for example, the drought, it's been primarily to try and you know, manage stormwater quality, but also alternative water supply through rainwater harvesting. Whereas Europe, where there's been a lot of water abundant for a long time, now we're only starting to realize water scarcity in recent times. It's been for other purposes. But what's the situation like in South America, where you've got this fairly, I guess, tropical, but somehow also in some cases more colder climates, because Bogota is pretty high up in altitude. Yeah. What's the situation like there? What do you design these systems for? Is it very similar to other places in the world? Well, let's say that, well, rainfall patterns are very different across Colombia and across South America. In Colombia, we got some of the driest area in the world. Well, okay. not, not in the world, but at least in the region. And some of the more wet and humid areas in the world. In the same country. Wow. So, for example, we have Choco, which is in the near to the Pacific Ocean, which is it rains like 10 meters or more than 10 meters per year. What? Wow. Of water. And we have in the north areas in which it rains less than, let's say, 30 centimeters a year. So, big, big... Okay. Um, big contrast. Yeah. Yes, big contrast. And in Bogota, on average, let's say we have less than a thousand millimeters per year, mm. more or less, less than a meter. Yeah. It changes, but what's happening is... Well, as many other places in the world, rainfall patterns are changing. So we got more intense and more frequent rainfall events. Most of the people concern is related to floods. And still, yeah. well, I, I fully agree. It's, it's a concern we have to handle with those events. But based on my background, I also think not only in the low frequency, but high amount of rainfall or high intensity rainfall, but also I always think in the most frequent ones. So... I think nature-based solutions can provide a variety of solutions for a large variety of uses for a large variety of rainfall types and ra rainfall amounts. For example, if we want to use and reuse water for different purposes, we have to think in those very frequent events because they're the ones that can provide in a regular basis somehow some water. We also have to take care of the water quality in the storm. So the rainfall runoff process convey a lot of pollutants. We have to think about how nature-based solutions can help us to treat storm water. Mm -hmm. And 
from my understanding, those events that carry the most of the pollutants are not the heaviest or not the more infrequent events, but are those that are kind of more regular ones. And cumulative over time as well. Yes. In a way, a similar mindset to how I've looked at it in terms of water quality as well in the Australian context. Yeah, so if you think about water reuse or if you think about uh, water quality or if you think on reducing the impact of floods, nature-based solutions can provide uh, useful tools to handle those ranges of purposes. So yes, of course, we have to think of very heavy rainfall events, but we have to also think about other type of rainfalls. Definitely. And in a way, there's that third element, which is, well, we're really going into the multifunctional nature of these kinds of systems. And this is a nice segue into, I guess, what you have also told me yesterday as one of the papers you feel has been life-changing. And this is amenity. And so you're undertook a study where you try to look at all three of these and in a way to support the planning of these systems as well. Yeah, that was the first time in which me and my colleagues were trying to include not only water-related issues, but also social and somehow ecosystemic aspects in the decision-making. So, for example, cities in Latin American contexts and developing contexts are very unequal. Mm -hmm. In a city, we have very rich areas in which there is plenty of nature-based solutions. I mean, they are there. They have trees, they have parks, they have green areas, open spaces. But as soon as you get into the low-income settings of the city, there is not much trees, there is not much parks. And so I see at that time that this is also a tool to provide more equal conditions to different parts of the city somehow. So to take that into account, we have to really understand where are the priorities. So where is the people that are being affected in a positive or negative way if we implement or not these solutions? So yes, we were start thinking and collaborating with people from other disciplines. So, for example, looking at data on, well, population density, economic conditions, also looking at for example, including other benefits beyond water regulation. So air quality, amenity, how to improve. Actually, the final aim is to impact the well-being of the population, the health of the population, via better handling water, better handling air quality, better providing recreational areas. So that was the first time I was outside my comfort zone, let's mm. say. I was trained as an engineer, but now I realize that we have to learn from different disciplines to come up with, let's say, optimal solutions. So this inequality, I guess you rely on upon a range of different variables, like you mentioned, the air quality, but also, I guess, the available green space. And this is where you then have to go spatial and you actually map it out across the city to then understand where we have this contrast in social inequality. This is in a way how you then sort of approach the planning process or the what you call a prioritization process of mm -hmm. where to select and maximize the benefits using nature-based solutions. Yeah, and that's rather important in developing context because we have very limited budget, mm. but plenty of issues to handle with. So somehow we have to start with something, yeah. but we have to do that starting point in a clever way. I mean, yeah. if we want to see actual benefits out of implementing not as much as we want, but as much as we can, we have to be better sure that if we implement something in some area of the city, we will get out, well... The best bang the for best, your buck. Yes, yeah. that's the point. That you do it right to begin with. I guess you there's not much room for error because you also risk potential backlash if it goes wrong the first time. Yes, you're right. Yeah. I mean, we can see errors as a learning opportunities, but yep. in our context, errors can stop innovation. And I guess to make sure you don't make that mistake and you find really the, the most optimal point, in this study where you really looked at that or you developed this planning framework, you really focused on a multi-scale approach where you look at the city scale, the local scale, and then really the micro scale. These were trying to plan technological solutions. Yeah, somehow it was a tool that was aimed to actually not only inform the planning, but also to actually get into the actual areas in which you need to intervene. So to really inform where to do something, what to do. Because I said before, errors can be a good way to learn, mm -hmm. but we don't have much room to, <laughs> to make a lot of errors. So yeah. we have to inform our decision as better as we can. Yeah. And so you have all these different aspects, but we sort of touched upon this earlier, but in a data scarce context, how do you then make sure that you're including all these different factors that you need to include and you're actually getting data or something that actually represents this? That's a good point. I mean, 
that somehow this is a way in which you have to recognize that you have to talk to other people, learn from others, look from different perspectives the problem. And we started working with many other disciplines that they have a different point of view of the same issue. They perhaps know other sources of data, other sources of information that can be useful. And actually they point out that something that is important for us perhaps is important, but there is many other aspects that we should include. So it's being like a journey, trying to have a more holistic understanding of the problem him. And that's being possible by talking to other people, talking to other disciplines, talking to other different stakeholders, let's say, or not only like academics, but also to technicians, but also to operators, but also to the community. It depends on the case study. It depends on the context. Not the same variable or the same issue is equally important in every single place in a city. So you have to be open-minded and there is not a unique solution to solve all the problems. So you have to be rather flexible and to yep. be aware of those differences and uniqueness. And so you relied on a technique we've covered on the show before, which is multi-criteria decision analysis, which allowed you to, I guess, incorporate a lot of the conversations you have with your stakeholders and the interactions with the different disciplines, but to then also, in a way, merge all the different variables that you've sort of listed. And this, in a way, gives you not only an aggregated picture of everything for the city, but it allows you also to look at how local scale results may then affect the city as a whole. Yeah, well, I think that's important because when I was studying in the UK, I realized that they were implementing a lot of nature-based solutions or SATs, but they were not achieving the goals they wanted. Okay. Perhaps because they were looking only, from my understanding, at the very local scale. Yeah. So in Bogota, what we tried to do was to have in mind that we have goals at the city scale, mm -hmm. but that can be achieved and supported by intervention at the very small and local scale. So that's why we came up with a framework that kind of enables a flow between what is our city scale objectives, how these guide our decisions at the, in a very small scale. Yeah. And then in the medium and long term, we will really see what we want to see. Yeah. Otherwise, we cannot ensure that we are providing the ways to get to our desired point. And I guess when you have one chance to really get it right, to do it good from the start, this is like a golden opportunity to then really apply these kinds of structured decision-making frameworks that help a modeling assessment or help a quantitative assessment. Yeah, you're right. We yeah. don't have much room to make errors. No, definitely. And I guess what was also interesting, especially when you work with maps and nature-based solutions, and I encountered this just as much in other countries as well, in other case studies, is this interplay between between public land and private land, what was the situation like there? I mean, your paper sort of shows that different types of technologies were suited for the different types of lands. But on the ground, when you when you work with this and you, you try to understand, you know, what is available to fund public projects and what people are willing to do privately, what were your observations? Well, Bogota, like any other large and developing city, has impact a lot of areas. So what we see is that most of the area is private land. Okay. And let's say on average, at least for Bogota, it's around 80 to 85 percent of the area is private. And the stormwater runoff is generated in those areas. Mm. So if we really want to handle and manage the stormwater at the city scale, somehow we can start with the public spaces available. It has a lot of benefits because citizens can learn, can have access, be near the natural solutions, but somehow the source of the problem is not only in the public areas, but mainly yeah. in the private ones. But the point is, we have to really understand what are the opportunities to intervene those areas because it's already developed areas. So we have to take any opportunity we have. For example, if we are renewing any urban part of the city, there's an opportunity to intervene not only in the public, but in the private lands. Yeah, and I guess, you know, it's uh, it's the case everywhere. When we think of source control as well, oftentimes, you know, if rain falls on a city, it starts on the roofs of houses, and these are usually in private land. Yeah, actually, we think that we are generating the problem in the private land, but at the same time is where we have the chance to use the water somehow. We can use or reuse the water in the private areas, but also in the public ones. But for example, if we want to substitute water supply, the conventional water supply system is in the private land in which we can intervene. So 
is where the problem is being generated now, but is also where we can provide also solutions. So private land is, plays a critical role in urban areas, particularly in, in very dense cities. And what's the receptivity like of private landowners? I know for a fact that, like an example from Australia, I've once spoken to some members of uh, city councils and they say when they do their assessments, they pretty much ignore what assets are in people's backyards because sometimes they just can't control it. They just have no idea whether people maintain it, whether they were built properly, whether they work even. What's the perception there? What's the reception like in Bogota? I think Bogota? It, it changes a lot depending on the city context. I mean, for example, nowadays I see more and more projects in Bogota using these LEED certificates, proving that they are doing well in managing energy, water, and other resources. And somehow they help the developers to better sell their products, such as building for offices or residential buildings. So in some cases, that attracts other type of consumers. I mean, if I'm a resident and I really want to pay a bit more for an apartment, but I really know that that apartment is providing solutions to our environmental issues in a city. So that's a way, or in commercial areas. But as I said, we have a lot of inequalities in the city. So for example, in low-income context in the city, the structure of the buildings is not good enough to put on the rooftop a green roof, let's say, because the structure is not safe enough. Or because of the people that don't want to do that. Because actually, there are some areas in the city in which the buildings are built in a progressive way. They first okay. start with one floor, and then if the family grow up or they have more money, they put another floor. And oh, so wow, modular. In that, modular, yes. In that cases, well, using the rooftop for capturing rainwater or to infiltrate or to deviate some water is not as useful as it can be in other contexts. So it rather depends. But definitely, for example, in renewal projects in which... There are in place like new laws. You are obliged to manage a certain amount of stormwater. The only way to achieve that is to implement uh, nature-based solutions in the private land. And so in these low-income contexts of the city, when you really don't have that ability to necessarily put your private assets, I guess this is where the opportunity in the public realm lies. And so in comes the prioritization framework that you developed that takes into account this kind of social inequality. Yeah, sure. But sometimes nature doesn't help much. For example, in my city, the places in which rain the less are those places in which we don't have good opportunities to impact in the private land, but in the public ones. Oh. So using trees is very difficult because rainfall is not enough and to maintain those trees will need a lot of water supply from other sources. So yeah. that's why you need a tool to use the correct nature-based solutions according to the needs because you want to improve the amount of trees in a certain area, of course, but nature doesn't help much sometimes. Or in other cases, nature helps and provides all the needed resources to put a tree in a certain area. Yeah, it's Murphy's Law, like that perfect combination of just things that don't match. And that's often, I guess, where the research gets exciting because then you try and find a solution despite all the challenges. Yeah, yeah. And so you've gone further into the ecosystem services space as well. So you've looked at, in the first part of your research, you looked at stormwater quantity and quality and also that amenity by mm -hmm. accounting for that social inequalities. But you've also started to go much further into ecosystem services and trying to treat them more explicitly. And some of your recent work that your students have been doing, you've also had things like urban heat and biodiversity as well. Yeah, I think it's a way to use a common framework to be able to speak to different other disciplines and also to put some uh, rigorosity in our work. Mm. So there are some standards how to handle with ecosystem services. And the key point there is, there is many ecosystem services and there is many nature-based solutions. And to really understand which ecosystem services can be provided by the certain nature-based solutions, it needs research. It needs a good understanding of the context, the physical context, the human context. So again, we need complex tools to provide simple answers to inform decisions that can impact or not our neighborhoods, our cities. And in this particular study, this is where you also started to really go deeper into going to the people, doing surveys, incorporating that into the quantitative assessment. So I guess I'm thinking just from what you said at the start of the show, once again, using the resources you have when you have data scarcity, because I couldn't imagine that you would have the perfect data set to do all this quantification. Because I myself, I think, struggle sometimes in Switzerland, mm -hmm. even though we have brilliant data sets, we sometimes can't find what exactly we need to do these ecosystem services assessment. Yeah, that's very challenging. Actually, we're carrying out a research study along with the city and we're trying to get the most data 
we can out of our case study area. But my feeling is that it will be very hard to reproduce those methodologies in other areas of our city. So somehow we have to produce tools that can be useful, that have enough data to support a decision, but those data sets cannot be too much complex because otherwise we will not be able to apply in a more regular way. And actually we are working in a very complex, let's say, social area in Bogota because the economic condition of the population is not that high. The educational status of the population is not that good as we want. And there is a lot of insecurity problems and so on. So we want to gather the opinion or gather the feelings of the population. But yeah. actually going there is not easy. Uh, trying to explain what a nature-based solution is not mm. easy. But I think what we have been found more inspirational so far, even in very complex situations, people rather see nature-based solutions as a potential way to improve their lives. And I think any kind of motivation for that then allows you to take them along for the ride. Yeah, which is really that crux of then this particular continuation of your work where you then created an opportunity index, you understood priorities and you merged that together with physical feasibility. So does it fit? Is there an opportunity? Is it a priority? And then ultimately, how do you optimize for that, for all those different possibilities? Yes. So what we really want to achieve is to provide insights and information that is actually useful for the planners to impact and change the way they are doing things now, taking into account the different objectives, different issues. And I think we are in a way to do that now. Yeah, I look forward to seeing where you head in future with that study. I think <laughs> it's fascinating. And I think, yeah, you're really accepting the fact that, first of all, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And second of all, we have to work with what we've got, you know, that data scarcity, but use the resources you have kind of attitude. And it really creates new ideas and new ways of doing things. So looking forward to seeing how you take that study further. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps in a, another Congress. Oh, definitely. Again, well, here in Lyon. Hopefully a bit earlier when I visit Bogota. Yeah, you have to go. So what do you think the future holds for Bogota and this practice? Do you think we're heading in a good direction? Do we still need to do a lot? Are there potential risks we should be aware of? Well, I see a lot of potential and I look positive into the future. I think that not only the research community, but also the institutions and actually the city in the planning are seeing nature-based solutions as a key to achieve more green cities. There is always risk, I think. I look positive to the future. A few years ago, when we started working on nature-based solutions and sustainable urban drainage system, we saw, and I saw, a lot of oppositors, let's say. I mean, in the water utility, people was concerned about the management and who is mm. in charge of what. Yeah. Definitely, it needs a change in the mindset. But now, I'm much more positive than a few years ago, because I think nature-based solutions is not only of the interest of the water utility anymore, only, but is of the interest of the people that are doing planning, are doing the renewal processes, are doing the landscaping. So I feel that the applications of nature-based solutions is now much better understand there. The potentialities and the the potential outcomes out of its implementation is now much better informed. And when you realize that there is a lot of positive outcomes out of its implementation, it's not about if we are doing it or not, but how to do it yeah. and how to assess the benefits to make wise decisions. So what we are now is we have, a let's say, a much better and common understanding of the potential uh, benefits we can get out of it. But what we need is to be sure what are those benefits, to quantify yeah. them. It's not easy, but that's our work. I mean, we researchers, we are able to provide those informations and uh, we are going to keep working on that now. And I think as engineers, we just like to quantify things generally. So. Yeah, true. One beautiful thing that has happened in my case is that many of our past students are now working for the municipality or working for the institutions. Uh, which is lovely. And they are pushing very much for those solutions to be implemented. So it's not about to have many people convinced, but a few champions that really yep. put forward the topic and to put it in the table and to foster the implementation. Yep. So I think the uptake 
of nature-based solutions in Bogota is being faster than I was expecting. Okay. And I see now, like, for example, they are constructing a new big street for the public transportation system. And now I see hundreds of tree pits, for example, to being constructed wow. uh, by retention cells. And it was my dream a few years ago, and now it's a reality. So we're still in the early phases, in the early stages, but if we do it well, and I think our tools has been important to make wise decisions. So I'm positive, but still a lot of room to do more research, to learn from our mistakes. And well, we'll see. Perhaps when you go to Colombia, you already see in place many of these nature-based solutions already constructed. Definitely. Proud moment. And Rosinante would be proud as well. Yeah, yeah. Did your cow have a name? Rosinante. That was the horse, I thought. Yeah, the horse. Oh, talk about the cow. Oh, the, I don't remember the name of the cow. But okay. <laughs> it was my horse, Rosinante. Fair enough. <laughs> Juan Pablo, this has been a fascinating insight into how you're tackling the topic that I've been also working on in a very different context. And it's been wonderful to listen to the stories you've had and actually to see that the implementation is moving. It's moving forward and sometimes at different paces, sometimes much faster than you would ever expect. So definitely enjoyed listening to that. And like I do with every guest on the show, I'd like to get to a few questions that reveal a bit more about you and allow listeners to learn more about, I guess, what drives you and you know what motivates you. And uh-huh. maybe they can take some advice from it as well. Starting with a, a very suitable question that reflects the vision you've been painting and also the optimism that you've sort of shown. If you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about the current situation, what would you change and why? The way we do things. I mean, we are used to work alone and more individually. If I had the opportunity to change something is to provide, not tools, but to provide ways to work in a more collaborative way. And actually it's funny because recently I heard that Colombians are the one of the most collaborative societies in the world. Oh, nice. They were comparing with other contexts such as the U.S., which is more individualist uh, mm-hmm. than our culture. But I think rather that we are perceived or from the social perspective as a more collective society, I think we have to better improve the way we work together to go towards a common goal. So nature-based solutions is a common goal for everyone, I think. No one can say or will say that I don't want nature-based solutions. Or every one of us want nature-based solutions. The point is how we define an objective and a way to implement them. So we really yeah. need to, to work together to have common goals. Yeah. And so I guess when you wake up every day and you're about to start your day, what's that inspiration that you have or to do what you do? Well, I have to be honest. I am now a father of two small girls. Okay. Veronica, which is six years old, and Matilde, which is three. And I'm married to Natalia. And I really want to help some way for them, for Veronica and Matilde or for their kids in the future to have a better city, a better world for them. That's my main inspiration every single day. That's lovely. And yeah, I'm newly married and I hope to be there one day too. And I'm looking forward to that moment. Oh, but yeah. congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think family also drives us, people that are close to us. And if we can do stuff to make the world better for them, especially yeah, the people, whether it's our kids, our students, I think sometimes research students also feel like kids to us. I think if we can do something to make the world better for them, the very next day, I think this really makes a difference and it's yeah. definitely something to draw inspiration from. Yeah, yeah. It's a small contribution, but if we work and act in a collective way, perhaps we can achieve a much better future. No, definitely. Was there a key moment, book or event or person that really completely changed the course of your career or your mindset? Well, as I mentioned already, two of my colleagues, uh, definitely Luis and Mario has been like... Um, People that really change the way I think. But talking about the, well, the technical aspects, uh, when I was studying, I read this Urban Drainage book of David Butler. And I think that's why I went to UK. I went to UK because David was at Imperial College where I did my PhD. And I was rather fascinated to be able to meet in person the guy who wrote the book I was learning from. And actually, I was lucky enough to have David as my evaluator or examiner of my PhD. Hey, he was my examiner too. Really? Yeah. Ah, another common thing. Yes. So that book, at least from the technical perspective, was key. 
for me. And this, these two guys, Luis and Mario, has been, well, the most impactful people in my personal and professional life. No, I think keeping these people close and you always go on that journey together, I think you cherish these moments. It's also with books. If a book really changed your life and you're able to meet its author, yeah, it's like that uh, meeting your hero kind of moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly felt that when I first got into research and I started to see all the different professors and other researchers who wrote papers that I really enjoyed reading or learned a lot from. So Yeah, actually, you remember that I mentioned that I attend my first international congress because of Joao. Yeah. And I clearly remember in that congress meeting David Butler, wow. the one from the book, in person. Wow. And I see him as a like a very friendly guy. And that impacted me a lot. I mean, a very intelligent and wise and very well known in research field, being so friendly. So I really understand that research and academia is about human relationships, is being about good people providing tools or knowledge to improve our lives. And just sharing in general, being open to share and to collaborate and to, yeah, any little bit of information I think can often make the biggest difference in someone's train of thought especially when they're stuck sometimes and yeah, being yeah. open to that. Yeah, really. I mean, if you collaborate with others, you learn from others and you can achieve much more bigger outcomes. Yeah, definitely. What was one of the most challenging situations that you have ever faced in your career to date and how did you overcome it? Well, again, I go back to my time of my PhD. Well, as I mentioned, I'm married now, but yeah. when I met my wife, I was about to leave Colombia to do the PhD. Oh. So we met in a lunch. Uh, I knew that in six months I will be leaving the country. And I said, okay, shall I start a relationship with someone? And well, how the future looks like, very uncertain. But then things happened. We decided to be together and um, we were looking at the future about that time. Okay, we try to be together in London, try to be together, but well, you never control life and things happen. And at the end of the day, it was not possible for her to go to London as soon as we want. So our relationship was suffering a lot. So reflecting on what was happening in my life by the time I attended my first International Congress in Edinburgh, I'm remembering now that exactly during that time, by the end of the week, when the conference was finishing, I got a message from my wife uh, saying that her sister passed away. No, no. She was a young lady. And of course, she was expecting her partner being beside her, providing support in that very difficult moment. Mm. But I was not able to do that. And um, so that was a critical point in my relationship. I mean... From that point onwards, the relationship was very difficult. So at that time, I was, well, months later, I was thinking, what about to do with my life? Shall I finish my PhD? Shall I go to Colombia? What's most important for me? My academic goal or my personal goal? I decided to keep both. Why not to mm. um, don't see conflicts, but rather see as an opportunity. As my case study was in Colombia, I said, okay, I can keep on working in my PhD in Colombia. And also I can go and stay with Natalia and see what happens. Yeah. So if I go back in time, I will take again the same decision to stop my PhD, go back home, put things in place, keep on working on my PhD. And uh, I'm very happy that I made that decision. I mean, now we are married. Now we have two beautiful girls. Now I have a permanent position in a university there. I'm doing what I love, which is research, to teach what I know and to learn from my students. So I'm very lucky. I feel very grateful. And I see, well, by that time, I was seeing that like a very difficult time. But now I see that if that wouldn't happen, perhaps um, all there will be the history. I don't know. I mean, my history is as it was to be, and I'm very happy with that. They say that every decision, you know, there's never a wrong decision. Every decision was the right decision at the time that you had to make it, given the circumstances. And I think we have to face these moments if we want to grow. And in a way, it's a very inspiring story. And thanks for sharing. No, my pleasure. I think I was listening to my heart by that time and still listening to my heart. And my heart tells me, you have to keep on working on sustainable urban drainage and nature-based solutions and to push forward its implementation in, in developing countries. I will keep on going. Rosinante is proud of you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs>
What tips and strategies can you offer in terms of time management? You told me just now the beautiful story and your two beautiful daughters. Uh, you have to actually show me a picture later. Yeah, yeah. But how do you maintain a balance between your professional and your personal time? Well, I think it's just a decision. I mean, yeah. to me, I prioritized. So I know that I can work endless and many hours in the university. But at the end of the day, what I want to be is besides my family and my two daughters. But actually, I want to be also at the university teaching and researching. So they can work together at the same time. So from my point of view, it's just a matter to optimize. It's a matter of multi-criteria decision analysis. And multi-objective optimization. Yes. And at the end of the day is to prioritize, identify which ones are your objectives in life. My objective in life is to be a good father, to be a good husband, to be a good son, to be a good brother, to be a good researcher. And I'm sure I'm not perfect in any of those roles, but I'm trying my best. And I need time for each of those. I also have friends. I like to run. I like to travel. I like to make food, try food, everything. Like... Uh, all of us. You did mention to me that you really enjoy food. I really, yes, yeah. I really do. And actually, we are in a place in which food is fantastic. Here in Lyon, it's very well known, even in France, which is well-renowned all over the world. So yes, it's a matter of prioritize, identify which one are your objectives, and then try to do your best. No, definitely. And so other than that, what advice can you offer to young engineers starting out or young researchers starting out? I think follow your hearts. I mean... Your heart really knows you and really better knows your objectives in life. So based on what your family and your relatives have gave to you in your childhood, based on that, take decisions not only with your head and your objectives in life, but also listen to your heart. That helped me a lot in both difficult and very happy moments. No, it's lovely advice. And yeah, I, I can certainly agree with that. I think these tough periods and those that I've been through as well, I think following your heart and listening to what it wants and sort of trusting in the process gets you further and also teaches you very important lessons in life. Yeah, oh, definitely. I, I do agree. Yeah. Juan Pablo, it's been an amazing time and really getting deep into work that we sort of have been doing in parallel in different contexts and being able to compare, but also hearing a bit more and learning a bit more about you. Because, yeah, we've met a few times. We haven't really had the chance to really sit down like this other than some of the drinks we've had, and, <laughs> you know, some of the, the events we've been to. But no, I really appreciate the time that you've taken out of this busy conferencing time to sit down with me and do this show. So like I do with every guest on the show, I always give my guests the last Last word. So if you have a final message for the listeners, what would that message be? Well, thank you very much, Peter, for your invitation. I'm really grateful for this time. I mean, I have been listening and hearing my heart during this time we have been recording this episode. So it's been an amazing experience to me. I'm quite happy with our conversation. I mean, it reflects what I am, what I want to do. When I got your email or your message inviting me, I was very scared because, well, I'm not very confident on my English. I'm not very confident on my, well, how my research outcomes looks like compared to your previous guest. I mean, because you have interviewed people that I really have like um, in my mind and in my head and in my uh, mindset, like my, let's say, reference reference yes people that has achieved many different things so i'm not sure if my life and my research is so excited and so inspirational for anyone but at the end of the day it's being inspirational for me so reflecting on that is is just fantastic for me and thank you very much thank you very much and thank you to you listeners for tuning into this amazing and heartwarming conversation with juan pablo rodriguez sanchez to read more about rocinante's antics engage more with vibrant colombia's landscape and culture or brush up your knowledge on urban drainage, check out the show notes over at peterambach.com slash podcast. If you enjoyed this show and are looking forward to more episodes, please do subscribe, follow this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Music, or wherever you are listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. Leave a review or pass this on to your friends and family to spread the beautiful messages from our many great guests. If you are curious about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website or social media. Head to peterembach.com, my YouTube channel, Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on Twitter at Peter M. Bach or Instagram at Peter M. Bach 87 Thank you very much for all your support so far. If you have feedback or suggestions, or just know someone who has an inspiring story to offer, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. The podcast intro and outro song is called Breaking Sweat by Balloon Planet. 
Stay tuned for our next episode and next guest to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges.